Let's try to start. I hope I can sort of get through it. We, we, we differentiate between allergic and non-allergic asthma. And this is what I will be talking about is a case of so-called intrinsic asthma for which we have, ah, yeah, please. We have three different antibodies, interleukin-5 antibodies. This is, oops, sorry. This is a receptor antibody. And this is the patient that I want to talk to you. She's 55 um, years old. She had, um, her asthma started when she was 35 in 1998. It was first called intermittent, and then it became progressively um, severe. She had unfortunately smoked 15 pack years of cigarettes um, until 2002, but then stopped this. She had no known allergies, and her body mass index was 23, so she was, she was not overweight. And um, she did have progressive um, symptoms, and her current treatment was inhaled corticosteroids and a long-acting beta-2 agonist. She did not um, take Montelukast or Teotropium because she felt it didn't help her. And she was, since 2015, she was continuously on a dose of um, prednisolone, which she was never able to lower below 5 milligrams. And she did have about 10 exacerbations per year, between 10 and 12 exacerbations every year, um, um, for which she required a burst of corticosteroids. Now, um, this is getting a bit difficult for me to, um, to read. She was working as a waitress. She had severe coughing. She woke up about three to four times per night, um, uh, three to four times at night per week. And she had severe dyspnea on exertion and was very um, uh, problematic with, um, in her job. Her total IgE, interestingly, was 393 but skin prick tests and all um, specific IgE levels were negative. But despite taking 5 milligrams of prednisolone, her eosinophil count was 3,620. I think it is important to recognize that currently the um, a, a recommendation is not to measure eosinophils in percent, but to measure it in absolute numbers. Um, because that is important for the treatment decisions. And um, at, at the time of presentation, when she came to us, she required 5 milligrams of prednisolone. Her FE1 was 1.3 liters, 49%, which we would agree for a 50-year-old is pretty bad. Now, in um, uh, 2016, we, that was then available, we decided to put her onto mepolizumab, and she received 100 milligrams every four weeks. Now, this is the lung function. This is the flow volume curve. Of course, this is a body, body plethysmography. The pulmonologists among you know this, but those who are allergists, they know the flow volume curve. She had five milligrams of prednisolone. Her FV1 was 49%, and she had this poor um, flow volume curve, which we would say, oh, this is fixed airflow obstruction. This is small um, uh, airway disease. Wouldn't we, Professor Belinsky, say this, this here? This is small airway disease. This is possibly remodeling. Oh, thank you very much. We put her on seven um, courses of mepolizumab. Uh, sorry, seven courses of mepolizumab. Um, uh, and the good thing was she didn't require any prednisolone anymore. No more prednisolone. And you see that the FV1 improved to 1.6 liters, which was 61%. So we looked at the patient and said, ah, this is much better. No more steroids no corticosteroid burst because no further exacerbation, lung function 61% of predicted, and we said, ah, this is again here, this is remodeling, this down here is small airway, it doesn't work very well, this down here is small airway disease, um, no. this is fixed airflow obstruction, we will not get rid of this. But the patient said that um, she had markedly improved her exercise tolerance without any dyspnea, the cough had disappeared, only occasional nocturnal symptoms, but she said, with this mepolizumab, it's very good for two weeks. I am totally free of symptoms for two weeks, but at three weeks and, and subsequently, my symptoms come back and I need my short-acting beta agonist more frequently. So we thought, this sounds like the effect of the mepolizumab reaches a peak and wanes off. And at the end of the four weeks, it doesn't work anymore. 
And she had 170 eosinophils despite of mepolizumab. There is no clear science behind this, but we feel that if the eosinophils do not go below 100, the effect of the anti-interleukin-5 treatment is not optimal. So we decided, um, uh, sorry, uh, is there any scientific basis for this? There is a study where they compared mepolizumab to reslizumab um, in a crossover design. And what you can see here is that in the patients post-mepolizumab, there was always, there was always post-mepolizumab a little bit of sputum eosinophilia present. But post resolizumab, you can see that the sputum eosinophilia in the study from Dr. Nair was gone. And the same is true over there. Post mepolizumab, there is. Yeah, but the, 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 the battery is not working very well. It's very quickly gone. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. So there is evidence that um, resolizumab may be more potent in reducing the eosinophilia. <clears throat> And you can see here that post resolizumab, the FE1 predicted was um, um, uh, better compared to the um, mepolizumab patients. So therefore, we decided to switch her as a trial to resolizumab, and that was very important for us. She received now three milligrams per kilogram intravenously for every four weeks, again, like the mepolizumab. But this time, she decided she was so well, she didn't report that after three weeks the effect waned off. She went on holidays for five weeks. And she came back after five weeks and said, I'm perfect. No more steroids, no more um, um, uh, dyspnea, no activity limitations, no cough, no nocturnal symptoms, and no loss of action after five weeks. But she said, I have to take my spray, I have to take my spray, otherwise I notice. So according to Gina, this is total asthma control on ICS LABA and reslizumab. Now the surprising thing which really made is an eye-opener for us, you remember the first lung function. This was the first lung fun function. FE1, 1.3 liters, and this reduced flow volume curve suggesting obstruction in the small airways. This is after seven courses of mepolizumab. Much better, but not normalized. We said, well, this is fixed airflow obstruction, this is smoking, this is remodeling, this is fibrosis of the airways. But this is after, sorry, no, this is bad. This is, sorry, what, what, what is this? Yeah. This has changed, strangely enough. This is the last after five administration of resolizumab. And the lung function is normal. And to be honest, colleagues, I have never seen this before. If you do a high-dose steroid burst, it doesn't look like this. This patient now has normal lung function after five courses of um, um, uh, uh, resolizumab. And therefore, the take-home message is, in patients with asthma and uh, um, anti-IL-5 therapy, resolizumab improves asthma control. And the resolizumab is administered at a higher dose than mepolizumab. And any patients who fails on mepolizumab should be tried on resolizumab because it seems to be more potent. And in patients who become symptoms-free over a four-week period of time, a trial of resolizumab is warranted. For us, we changed our um, practice in, in, in such that we every patient that we want to put on anti-interleukin-5, we start with resolizumab because we think it's the most potent one, and after four weeks, we reassess if anything has happened. And if there is a big change, then we discuss with the patient whether he wants to continue on intravenous treatment or whether we should give a try of subcutaneous treatment. But it doesn't make much sense in our eyes to start with mepolizumab because if after seven weeks you have a partial response, you don't know if a change to resolizumab may help you. And if it doesn't help, then you have a very long period costly period before you decide that the treatment is ineffective. And this is for the time being my case. I would have a second one maybe later. Спасибо большое. Есть ли вопросы к профессору Верхову для уточнения деталей? Да, пожалуйста. Что ж тут смешного-то? Простите, будьте честны.
заключение. Я по комментарию. Да? Я хотел уточнить, получала ли пациент, то есть, ну, действительно ли пациентка получала преднизолон и какой у нее был уровень кортизола, когда она была взята на лечение биологической терапии. I think that she has been taking it because that was the reason why she came. Yeah? She said, I want to get rid of the prednisolone, which I have to take every day. And as you know, the guidelines suggest that we should keep oral prednisolone as the last resort nowadays. Before, um, before, we, um, before that, we should treat uh, or check all the available biologics. So yes, I think the likelihood that the, she took the prednisolone was very high because she came explicitly because she said, I have to take so much pregnancy alone, I want to get rid of this. Nobody expected her to profit with this lung function improvement. Yeah? That was the secondary sort, sort of collateral efficacy. Our reason actually was to get her off pregnancy alone. Yeah. Uh, the point by Professor Emelianov is very well taken that you need to be careful with patients who have been long-term on prednisolone because if we reduce it, they can run into adrenal insufficiency. My personal experience is this very rarely happens, actually, and it is with five milligrams you can try to go to zero um, abruptly. Еще вопросы, но есть вопрос у меня. Профессор Вирхов, у меня два вопроса. Первый вопрос. Очень высокая эзенофилия. И пациент переносил эзенофильную пневмонию в верхних долях. Может быть, причиной резистентности к терапии является хроническая эзенофильная пневмония? No, I... Very good question. I believe that I believe that the um, eosinophilic pneumonia was a misdiagnosis. Mm. It very often happens that patients with intrinsic asthma suffer from pneumonia. Then you find high eosinophils and pneumonia, and people who do not understand the clinical syndrome and the spectrum consider this to be eosinophilic pneumonia. The chest x-ray and everything else did not suggest anything like eosinophilic pneumonia. And as you know, the symptoms the patient had are very typical for asthma and not typical for eosinophilic pneumonia. Eosinophilic pneumonia, as you know, causes restrictive airflow impairment with um, 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 shortness of breath, but not this kind. Mm -hmm. And the second question, please, 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 где получал пациент мепализумаб и где пациент получал реслизумаб? We have a um, um, clinical center for severe asthma, and the patient was seen there by a referral from a pulmonologist in private practice, as is the usual case in Germany, and then treated as an outpatient in our clinic. Where he or she... Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. We do the resolizumab as a short infusion for about 20 minutes and then we ask the patient also with the subcutaneous injection, we ask them to wait for 30 minutes. With the first injection, we ask them to wait two hours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The question in German, very, very good, very good German. The question was, how long do you need treatment? And congratulations to your German. And it is not a cure. It is a treatment as long as you give it, the asthma is in control. If you stop it, it takes about four to six to eight weeks for the asthma to come back. 
And there is concern that if you stop anti-interleukin-5 treatment, Resli, Mepo, Benra, if you stop this, then actually the symptoms come back and are worse than they were before you started. So there is overshoot. And if you reintroduce the treatment then, you do not get to the same good effect. So any reduction should be done very carefully. И все-таки я прошу вопросы задавать по клиническому случаю, по уточнению, потому что у нас сейчас будет дискуссия. Еще вопросы? Профессор Вирхов, вы хотели показать вторую э, презентацию? Давайте. It's a different, it's a different case. It is a 73-year-old man. Включите вторую презентацию, пожалуйста. 73-year-old man. In childhood, he was a competitive sportsman. He was an apparatus gymnastics on parallel bar. Never had any respiratory symptoms. No known allergies. Um, mo, 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 mo. Continue, 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 continue. Yep, 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 yep. Кто устанавливал презентации? Можете помочь? Yep, 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 yep. yep. That's him. When he was 30, he had coughing, only symptom. When he was 40, he had dyspnea on exertion. In 2009, he had dyspnea attacks day and night. But the problem was the gentleman had been smoking 50 pack years. So for each of us, he would fulfill all the criteria for COPD. He had comorbidities, the typical comorbidities in my country, congestive heart failure and atri atrial fibrillation, recurrent pulmonary embolism, and he was treated with the vitamin K antagonist. He had a nephrectomy in 2009 due to renal cell carcinoma, but no metastases. He had sleep apnea syndrome and CPAP therapy. He had carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Sure. Yeah. Sensomotoric polyneuropathy and a, a disc hernia. And this was his treatment. He received a large number of treatments, including for his COPD, as it was called, for Motorol. But in 2015, he had recurrent hospitalizations due to COPD exacerbations. And he was admitted to our hospital for tertiary care re-evaluation or evaluation. Because his wife, his wife said, don't come back before they find something. <laughs> yeah, the wife is always very important. I don't want you back before they found something. This is not okay. So he came, and this is his lung function. And what you can see, massive hyperinflation. Residual volume is twice the normal. Very bad lung function, very bad FE1. Massively elevated airway resistance. Обратимость была 71%. Поэтому мы подумали о том, что неплохо было бы посмотреть на этого пациента более пристально. Когда мы на него только посмотрели, уровень азота в выдыхаемом воздухе был 113 миллиардов минус первой степени, если мы говорим про лейкоцит 14,9, и азинофилы 10,1%. На полторы тысяч, то есть полторы тысячи на микролитр. При этом у него был аллерген специфический иммуноглобулин Е к клещам домашней пыли. Общий уровень иммуноглобулина Е 546 единиц на литр. Перед тем, как мы начали биологическую терапию, мы назначили высокую дозу бета-агонистов длительного действия, ингаляционного глюкокортикостероидов. Кроме того, мы провели импульс-терапию преднизолону, Временно отменили карвидерлол. 
Давайте посмотрим на легочную функцию. Изначально объем форсированного выдоха в первую секунду был равен 1,2 литра, сейчас 2,8 литра, то есть увеличение на 88%. Однако не обязательно у пациента, который всю жизнь курил, хобл. У них может быть астма. То есть на самом деле это курильщик-астматик. И таким пациентам необходимы ингаляционные кортикостероиды, а иногда и биологическая терапия. Я просто обращаю ваше внимание на эту проблему, потому что не всем пациентам требуется биологическая терапия, но в любом случае перед ее назначением важно провести очень тщательную диагностику. И ингаляционные глюкокортикостероиды способны уменьшить численность эозинофилов в периферической крови. Если вы поднимаете глюкокортикостероидов со средней дозы на высокую дозу, в этом случае мы уменьшаем число эозинофилов примерно вдвое. Какой вывод можно сделать из этого клинического случая? Во-первых, пациент очень долго курил, но при этом у него на самом деле не было хронической абструктивной болезни легких. Тем не менее, это не говорит о том, что можно продолжать курить. Лучше, конечно, бросить курить. В то же время есть пациенты с предполагаемым диагнозом Хоббл. Мы называем это синдромом невероятной радости, потому что вам кажется, что вы все про этого пациента поняли. Но на самом деле причина симптомов не Хоббл, а, например, астма. И если пациентам просто будут назначать антагонистам кариновых рецепторов или будут назначать бета-агонисты длительного действия, то пациенту может стать хуже, если у него на самом деле не хобл. И вывод из этого клинического случая сводится к следующему. Каждый раз, когда мы проводим обследование пациентов с обструктивными заболеваниями легких, нужно посмотреть на количество эозинофилов в крови. Кроме того, нужно быть осторожными с пациентами, которые принимают ингаляционные кортикостероиды, поскольку они, этот препарат влияет на численность эозинофилов. Ну и перед тем, как я скажу огромное спасибо за внимание, мы надеемся, что в переводе было все понятно.